Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Kohler Group's webinar series. The topic for this week's series is taking advantage of Hong Kong's business environment. Today we are having part three of five webinar sessions and today we'll be speaking about the challenges for employment in Hong Kong. Hong Kong remains an undisputed destination for skilled graduates and expatriates in sectors such as banking, finance, consulting, IT, or marketing. Yet, there are many aspects that should be considered when embarking on employment. In this webinar, Marcus Salgado, consultant at Kohler Group's Hong Kong office, will examine the challenges related to employment contracts, visa applications, salaries tax, and retirement schemes. And finally, the challenges that expatriates face when relocating and working in Hong Kong. But before we begin today's presentation, I would just like to make sure that everybody can hear me. So if you would be so kind as clicking on the hand button in your control panel, that will allow me to know that the sound system is functioning. Please note that as is very typical with many webinars, there may be some instability with the internet line and as such the sound system may not be so good just stay on the line we will fix it as soon as possible within a few short minutes if you are having any problems listening to us through your mic and speakers on your computer then just know you do have the option to switch to a telephone landline to have a better sound system so you can choose either a telephone landline or the mic and speakers on your computer Please note that the uh, presentation today will be recorded and will be distributed together with the presentation at the end of today's session. As is typical with our webinar series, I do encourage all attendees to submit questions and comments into the question section of the control panel. We will have a 15 to 20 minute Q&A session at the end of today. So please, please don't be shy. It's always lovely to see new faces at our webinar series. For those of you that are new, I would just like to introduce who we are. Kohler Group is a CSC company. We are established within Asia, within three jurisdictions, Hong Kong, Singapore, and China. We have over 120 professionals located throughout our 10 offices that are advising foreign investors with their market entry and expansion within the territory. One of our unique advantages is we do speak over 10 languages internally and are able to communicate with our clients in their mother tongue. A little bit about myself. My name is Christina kohler Coluccia. I'm a director with Kohler Group and I will be the moderator for today's session. I've been with the company since 2003 when I relocated to Shanghai to open our very first China office. Since then, I've been working with foreign investors with their market entry and expansion within the Chinese territory, but also nowadays within the Asia Pacific region. Together with my colleagues, we generate a number of written resources. One in particular is our monthly magazine entitled China Invest.biz. If you're interested in subscribing to all of our online digital resources, it can be done so free of charge on our homepage by simply inserting your email address into the section called China Invest.biz information series. Now without further ado, I would like to have Marcus introduce himself and begin today's presentation. Marcus? Thank you, Cristina, for the introduction and thanks to all the attendees for joining my webinar. My name is Marcos Salgado and I have developed most of my professional career advising companies on market entry and expansion across Asia. At Cole Group, I am responsible for the Spanish desk where I have helped multiple companies in the design of corporate structures and implementation of business plans. I am a qualified lawyer and I am a member of the Spanish Bar Association. Regarding my academic background, I have studied law at the University Complutense of Madrid and I have also earned a master's degree in business management at the University of Huddersfield in the United Kingdom. Next. So now uh, let's talk about the, the agenda. In the first part, I will talk about the labor legislation in Hong Kong with a special focus on the employment ordinance. I will provide you with a quick overview of the basic rights under the employment ordinance. 
In the second part, I will talk about visas. I will explain the main requirements for securing an employment visa and an investment visa, and the pertinent requirements for people from mainland China. In the third part, I will explain the salary tax in Hong Kong, its calculation, the difference between a Hong Kong employment and a non-Hong Kong employment, and the tax rates. And finally, lastly, in the fourth part, I will talk about the NPF, the Mandatory Provident Fund, its coverage rates, and how to receive the fund. Next. So let's start with the, with the first part, the labor legislation in Hong Kong. A company which operates in Hong Kong has to comply, obviously, with all the Hong Kong regulations, even though decisions made by British courts still have a persuasive authority. From all the labor laws in Hong Kong, the employment ordinance is the most important enactment and it establishes the main labor and employment conditions and terms of service. The ordinance provides a basic floor protections, benefits and entitlements. It was enacted in 1968 and it's applied to every employee engaged under a contract of employment, both locals and foreign nationals, and it prevails to any contractual terms less favorable than the ordinance. Next. The employment ordinance distinguishes between employees under an employment contract and employees employed under a continuous employment contract. Employees under a continuous employment contract, temporary or part-time, are employed continuously by the same employer for four weeks or more, with at least 18 hours work in each week, and they are entitled to all the benefits under the employment ordinance. Let's see the, the main characteristics of this of this type of, of contract. Maximum hours of work per week as per contract. The common practice is between 50 and 60 hours. Maximum number of work days per week as per contract being the common practice five days a week. The overtime work is also regulated in the pertinent employment contract. Pay public holidays are 12 a year. There are 12 public holidays paid a year, but the Hong Kong government has announced 17 public holidays for next year. Paid annual leave, the minimum days are as follows. First year of service, you are entitled to seven days. Second year, seven days. Third year, eight days. Fourth year, fourth year nine days. Fifth year, 10 days. Sixth year, 11 days. Seventh year, 12 days. Eight year, 13 days. And nine or above, 14 days. Regarding the maternity leave, an employee is eligible for 10 weeks paid maternity leave if she has been employed for not less than 40 weeks. If she has been employed for less than 40 weeks, the employee can still take 10 weeks maternity leave but without pay. The probation period is as per contract. The common practice is between one and six months. The notice period is as per contract, but not less than seven days. In the absence of contract, it would be one month. Regarding the employment period, I've been asked many times the following question. Can an employer or an employee terminate a contract without notice or payment of wages in lieu of notice? The answer is yes, it's possible. An employer can dismiss an employee if the employee has committed very serious misconduct or fails to improve after the employer's repeated warnings. On the other hand, the employee can also terminate his employment agreement without notice or payment. If he feels physical danger by violence or disease, is subjected to ill treatment by the employer or has been employed for not less than five years and he's certified by a registered medical practitioner as being permanently unfit for the type of work he is doing. The medical insurance is mandatory, and under the employee's compensation insurance, employers are required to take out employees' compensation insurance, even for part-time local domestic helpers. And finally, the NPF is also required, and I will discuss this 
I will talk about it in, in the part four. Next, please. On the other hand, employees under an employment contract are entitled to the most basic protection. Maximum hours of work per week as per contract. The common practice is between 50, 40 and 50 hours. 40 to 50 hours, sorry. Maximum number of work days per week as per contract. The common practice is five days. Employees on an employment contract have 12 days of public holidays and the overtime work is also regulated as per contract. The probation period is also agreed on the employment contract. The MPF and the medical insurance are required and the termination notice period follows the same rules that for the employees and their continuous employment contract. However, employees on an employment contract are not eligible for paid annual leave paid annual sick leave, paid maternity leave, and end of year payment. Next please. The contract terms must comply with the minimum protection under the employment ordinance and any change in the terms of the contract requires the employee's previous consent. Employment contracts can be oral or written. If the employment contract is written, it should be ideally written both in English and Chinese, and the employer must provide the employee with a written copy of the employment contract. Next, please. Many foreign companies in Hong Kong prefer to retain workers or an independent contractor to cut costs and avoid compliance with labor laws. A contractor is not entitled to employees' compensation insurance, mandatory profit and fund, NPF, annual leave, sick leave, and maternity leave. Next, please. Some employees are intentionally misclassified in order to cut costs and avoid compliance with labor laws. However, as you can imagine, the court does not simply look at the labeling of a person to determine employment relationship. The court will apply a number of tests to determine if a worker is an employee or a self-employed person. In other words, the court will examine all the features of the party's relationship. Relevant factors to consider are the degree of control that the company can exert over the individual, the extent to which the individual is an integral part of the company, if the company has any obligation to provide work, and if the individual is running his or her own business and needs to manage a schedule and financial risks. Employer misclassification of the employees as independent contractors is unfortunately a widespread phenomenon that can lead to significant fines. Next, please. So, a case study um, can be seen here where the court states that there is a contract of employment against an independent contractor by examining the nature of the employment relationship. So, the court has examined the nature of the employment relationship and has decided, has confirmed that there is a contract of employment and there is no an independent contractual relationship. And the features that, that were taken into consideration are the following. The degree of control, if the equipment is owned by the worker or provided by the employer, if the worker hires his own assistants or helpers, the degree of financial risk taken on by the worker, and whether, or whether and to what extent the worker has the opportunity to profit from sound management in the performance of his tasks. So, by taking into consideration uh, the main uh, nature, the main features of the relationship, the court can determine if an employee, uh, if there is a contract of employment or if 
the individual is self-employed. Next, please. So in the second part, I will talk about visa applications. And let's start with the employment visa. Next. The general employment visa, uh, the general employment policy, sorry, GEP, is quota free and not sector specific. However, some nationalities are excluded from the general employment policy. Chinese residents of the mainland and nationals of Afghanistan, Cuba, Laos, North Korea, Nepal, and Vietnam. Next. The requirements for applying for a working visa are the following. No security objection, good education background, technical qualifications, professional abilities and or relevant work experience, a genuine job vacancy, a confirmed offer of employment, an adequate remuneration package. The processing time is around four weeks. So let's give, let me give you an example of uh, a, an employment visa application. So you can understand how the immigration department assess every factor when it comes to provide or not a working visa. So let's say that, for example, Mike, an investment banker that has been working for five years in London, has recently got a job in Hong Kong, and he's going to be paid 20,000 Hong Kong dollars a month. So Mike, the company that is hiring Mike, submits the application of the visa, and the immigration department will check every single detail of the application to see if Mike meets the requirement to have a working visa in Hong Kong. So there is no security objection, so Mike meets with this requirement. Mike has a good educational background, he has a bachelor's and probably a master's degree in finance, so his educational background is excellent. He has a very strong work experience, has been working for over five years in the banking industry, in one of the most important financial capitals in the world, London. There is a genuine job vacancy and there is also a confirmed offer of employment. However, as I said before, the salary is only 20,000 Hong Kong dollars. So the immigration department, after considering the salary, decides that Mike doesn't qualify to get a working visa because the salary of 20,000 and Hong Kong dollars is much lower than the average salary in the industry for an investment banker. And let's put now another example. Let, let me give you another example of success. Let's say that a Hong Kong office needs an export manager for covering the Southern European market. And an Italian citizen, Marcello, applied for a job. And he is very successful with his application and he gets the working visa within four weeks. Marcello has eight years of work experience as a sales manager covering the Spanish, Italian and Portuguese market. And he will have in Hong Kong a salary of 40,000 Hong Kong dollars. The reason why in this case the immigration department has decided that Marcello is eligible and meets the requirements for securing a working visa are the following. First of all, there is no security objection. Second, Marcello has a strong experience, has been working as a sales manager in the South European market and he has some skills that are not immediately available in Hong Kong. There is also a genuine job vacancy, there is an offer of employment and Marcello will get a good salary, a salary of 40,000 Hong Kong dollars which is in accordance with the position and with the industry in Hong Kong. Next example, uh, sorry, next slide. Chinese residents of the mainland must apply through a different scheme called Admission Scheme for Mainland Talents and Professional. 
And even though the requirements are more or less the same than the general employment policy, there is usually a general perception that it is harder for Spanish nationals to secure an employment visa in Hong Kong moving here directly from the mainland. Next, please. However, there is an exception. A Chinese citizen can also apply for a working visa through the general employment policy if the applicant has a permanent residence overseas or has been res residing overseas for at least one year immediately before the submission of the application. Next, please. In this slide, I will talk about the investment visa. It, it's important to note that the main requirement for securing an investment visa is making a positive contribution to the local economy. And therefore, the applicant must provide the immigration department with the following documents. A business plan, which includes a two years business plan and a two year forecast of the financial situation of the company. Business turnover, only if the applicant has a business overseas or has joined a business in Hong Kong. Financial resources, personal bank statements and company bank accounts. The number of jobs that the new business will create locally. And the introduction of new technology or skills that the company will generate, if applicable. The processing time is between two and six weeks. It is usually around four weeks. Next, please. There is also an investment visa for startups. And in order to be able to apply for this visa, the business must be supported by a government-backed program. We can see here several examples of, of government-backed programs. Programs, for example, Start Me Up, HK Venture, EQ Up, Cyberport, and the sign incubation program. So if your business is supported by one of these programs, you can apply for an investment visa as entrepreneur for startups. Next, please. So now let's talk about the salary tax. Next. Tax figures are required to complete and send the tax return back to the Inland Revenue Department within one month from the date of issue of the return. Not filing the tax return on time may lead to penalties or even prosecution. The individual tax return must be filed even if the employee has no, no taxable income. Regarding the year of assessment, it runs from 1st of April to 31st of March of the following year. It's important to note that self-employed people pay the profits tax instead of the salary tax. So if you are self-employed, remind that you will need to file the profits tax. The calculation of the salary tax is very simple and is based on the amount of income, salaries, wages, commissions, tips, bonuses, allowances, perquisites, leave pay, saving or retirement awards, contract gratitudes, and non-cash benefits such as the provision of a place of residence and the granting of a stock-based awards, tax allowances, and also deductions for approved charitable donations, self-education expenses, home interest, etc. Regarding the tax allowances, Hong Kong has a great advantage in terms of allowances. If you give your employee a housing allowance, it will only be taxed at 10% of the value, no matter how much the allowance is. Next, please. Hong Kong employment versus non-Hong Kong employment. It's crucial to determine if an employee has a Hong Kong employment or not to know whether or not the employee has to pay taxes in Hong Kong. The Inland Revenue Department usually establishes three factors to, deter to determine to define a non-Hong Kong employment. 
First, the contract of employment was negotiated, concluded, and is enforceable outside Hong Kong. Second, the employer is resident outside Hong Kong. In other words, the employer has its central management and control outside Hong Kong. And third, the employee remuneration is paid outside Hong Kong. I want to give you some examples so you can see more easily when an employment is a Hong Kong employment or not. John from the UK works as a researcher for a company in Beijing. For a research project, he has worked in Hong Kong for 40 days. Does John have a Hong Kong employment? There is no doubt that John has a non-Hong Kong employment. Since the contract of employment was negotiated, concluded and is enforceable in mainland China. The employer resides in mainland China. The employer has its main and its central management and control in mainland China. And John's remuneration is also paid outside Hong Kong, also in mainland China. So John does not have a Hong Kong employment. Another example. Christine has been working for over 10 years for a multinational in Prague, in Czech Republic. In May, she was appointed as a regional manager for Southeast Asia, and now she's traveling and working in Manila, Hanoi, Kuala Lumpur, Bangkok, and Hong Kong. Does Christine have a Hong Kong employment? Christine seems to have a non-Hong Kong employment, since the contract of employment was negotiated concluded and is enforceable outside Hong Kong, probably in Czech Republic. The employer resides outside Hong Kong, and Christine's remuneration is very likely being paid outside Hong Kong. And a final example, in this case of a Hong Kong employment. A French company has seconded Antoine to work for the Hong Kong branch as a full-time marketing manager in Hong Kong. Does he have a Hong Kong employment? It's very obvious that Antoine has a Hong Kong employment, and consequently, Antoine will be taxed on his full income as a local employee. Why? Very simple, because his contract is enforceable in Hong Kong. His employer resides in Hong Kong, and he is paid in Hong Kong. Next, please. Work visits. Okay, are work visits taxed? A work visit involves making a trip to Hong Kong for training, attending a conference, or reporting work progress. And there is a general rule. Income from services provided in Hong Kong during visits not exceeding a total of 60 days is excluded from tax. But if the visits exceed 60 days, the tax must be paid and is calculated on the days in days out basis. A visit is a short or temporary stay, and in counting the number of days, both the day of arrival and departure must be included. Let me give you an example. If you arrive in Hong Kong on the 20th of April at 11.59 p.m., and you leave Hong Kong on the 21st of April, at 11 a.m., this visit will be counted as a visit of two days, even though you have to stay in Hong Kong for just 10 hours. And I will, I will give you another example now. Jose Luis, who works for a company in Madrid, came to Hong Kong to buy goods on 1st of June 2016, and up to 31st of March, uh, 2017, he made three trips. Is Jose Luis taxed in Hong Kong? Well, as I said before, if all the trips count more than 60 days, Jose Luis will be definitely taxed in Hong Kong on a days-in, days-out basis. If not, if the visits, if the trips count less than 60 days, he will not be taxed. Next, please. Now, let's talk about the tax rates. The taxation of Hong Kong for individuals is unlikely for corporations progressive. 
So this is very simple. The more you make, the more you pay. On the first 40,000 Hong Kong dollars, you will be taxed at 2%. On the next 40,000 Hong Kong dollars, you will be taxed at 7%. On the next 80,000 Hong Kong dollars, you will be taxed at 12%. On the remainder, you will be taxed at 17%. There is no tax on dividends, there is no tax on capital gains, and there is no tax on income earned abroad. Next, please. Do directors of Hong Kong companies need to pay the salaries tax? In Hong Kong, a directorship is regarded as an office. Consequently, generally speaking, if you hold a Hong Kong office, your earnings will be fully accessible. And Consequently, earnings from a non-Hong Kong directorship are therefore exempt from salaries tax. So the general rule, as you can see, is very easy. Hong Kong office, earnings fully taxed. Non-Hong Kong office, earnings will not be taxed. Next, please. So in this last part, I want to talk about the mandatory provident fund, the MPF. The NPF stands for Mandatory Provident Fund and it was implemented since year 2000 and it provides a secure retirement benefits for the workforce of Hong Kong. The NPF covers employees between 18 and 65 years old, both full-time and part-time, as well as self-employed persons also between the age of 18 and 65 years old. Next, please. As you can see, the contribution to the MPF is made both by the employer and the employee. If the salary is below 7,100 Hong Kong dollars, the employer's contribution is 5%, and the employee wouldn't have to contribute to the MPF, would be optional. If the salary is between 7,100 and 30,000 Hong Kong dollars, both employers and employees have to contribute equally 5%. And then over a salary of, of over, over 30,000 Hong Kong dollars of salary, the contribution is also made both by the employer and employee and is a contribution of 1,500 Hong Kong dollars and there is also the possibility of making an additional contribution. This is optional. Next, please. If you are retired, you can receive your accrued benefits in a single payment and therefore receive all your own contributions and employer's contributions plus the investment return. However, it's important to note that there is also the option of receiving all the accrued benefits before the age of 65. In case of early retirement after reaching the age of 60, permanent departure from Hong Kong, let's say for example, an American expatriate that decides to go back to the US. If this American citizen wants to leave Hong Kong permanently, he can receive all the accrued benefits when leaving Hong Kong. This means that he can receive all his own contributions, employer's contributions, plus the investment return. Um, it's also possible to receive the accrued benefits before the age of 65 in case of death, total incapacity, small violence, and terminal illness. So this is all my presentation. I hope it has been very helpful for you. And now is the turn for questions. So please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, yeah, there are a few questions that have come in. Um, so let's, let's go through them one by one. Um, is the employment ordinance applied to every employee in Hong Kong, or are there also exceptions? That's a very good question. Um, 
generally speaking, the employment ordinance is applied to every employee, but there are few minor exceptions. For example, in relation to family members, that's a very typical, uh, typical and common exception, family members employed in a family business. Also the case of the merchant seamen, and also a very important exception for apprenticeships. In those cases, the employment ordinance is not applied. But, as I said before, in most cases, the employment ordinance is applied to every employee engaged under a contract of employment. So, there are just few exceptions, but generally speaking, it's applied to most, I would say, 99.9% .9 of the uh, contract of employment. Great. Uh, if an employee agrees to give up his rights and benefits under the employment ordinance when he signs his employment contract, will that term be considered valid? No, no. That term cannot be considered valid because any term of an employment contract that extinguishes or reduces any right, benefit or protection conferred by the employment ordinance will not be valid. So that term will be void. So if the employee gives up his rights, even though his will is given up, it will not be applied. The, the term will be considered void and it will not be applicable and enforceable. Uh, can a person employed by, by two or more companies claim MPF for uh, deductions? Yes, yes, it's possible. An employee can claim a deduction for the mandatory contributions made to different MPF, uh, MPF schemes, but there is a limit. The maximum amount of the deduction is limited to 18,000 Hong Kong dollars. So any contribution exceeding this limit will not be deductible. Great. Um, the next question is, uh, can a Hong Kong company employ people that are located overseas, meaning they're not residing uh, in Hong Kong? Mm. This is a very typical question and many clients have, me, have asked me this before and well, usually uh, from my first-hand professional experience, most of the clients are interested in hiring people from mainland China using the Hong Kong company and this is not possible. This is not possible. A Hong Kong company cannot employ a mainlander to work in mainland China because there are many issues, for example, related to the social insurance and also with the tax liabilities. And it's not possible either to employ a foreign national to work in mainland China, let's say, uh, a worker from the UK to work in mainland China using the Hong Kong company. For a very simple reason, a Hong Kong company is not able to provide a Chinese employment visa. So it's not possible, but there are some solutions. So for example, uh, at Core Group, we have the solution of providing an instant office solution, which basically provides the customers with the ability to recruit or second staff to our office in China, Hong Kong, or Singapore. So corporate service provider like, like Kohler Group can help uh, the clients who are interested in, in seconding or recruiting staff in mainland China. Uh, thanks, Marcus. The, the, the next question is in relation to the visas. Um, there is a business, if there is a business owner, uh, what scenario or can you provide a scenario that would apply to him in terms of what type of visa he should apply for? The entrepreneurship visa or the employment visa? Well, definitely the entrepreneurship visa. Uh, for a very simple reason, a business owner wants to run a business, wants to manage a business. So an employment visa is designed basically to work for a company. It's not designed for running your own business. So if you want to come to Hong Kong and you want to run your own business, you want to manage your own business, you need to apply for an investment visa. And let me tell you something. Setting up a Hong Kong company and employing yourself as an employee of your own company is not an option available in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, there are no self-sponsorship visas like in, any, in other jurisdictions where you can use, use your Hong Kong company, your company 
to employ, to employ yourself as a worker of your own company. That's not possible in Hong Kong. And if you do that, the application will not be successful because the immigration department will see that you are the shareholder of your own company and therefore your visa application will be probably be refused. Um, and the last question we're going to have for today, I know there are other questions that have come in. Um, I apologize that we're, we're running out of time, but be assured that Marcus will answer you at the end of today's session. Um, is it possible, because there are a lot of scenarios um, uh, or business models in, that are running in this way, um, is it possible that an individual, whether, whether foreigner or Hong Kong Chinese, they're residing in Hong Kong but, and they're employed by a Hong Kong company, but every day they're traveling to China for business? I mean, particularly with the open borders between Hong Kong and Shenzhen, um, is, that, is that model feasible? And vice versa, is a mainland Chinese residing in Shenzhen um, able to travel daily to Hong Kong for work? What, 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 are the, what are the considerations you have to make in that type of model or case study? Mm -hmm. Well, if a mainlander lives in Shenzhen and works in Hong Kong, that's perfect because the mainlander has a working visa in Hong Kong and he has an employment here, an employment visa, and it's absolutely fine. He can come here every day, he can work, and then he will pay access here, he will contribute to the NPF, and there is also uh, an agreement, a tax agreement, between mainland China and Hong Kong for avoiding the double taxation. So that's not a problem. However, if a foreign holds a working visa in Hong Kong, he cannot work in Shenzhen, so he would need, because he would need a Chinese employment visa sponsored by a Chinese company in, in Shenzhen. So that, that wouldn't be a possible. That wouldn't be possible. So this foreigner can go to Shenzhen with a business visa, but he cannot work there permanently. He cannot live in Hong Kong and cross the border every day to go to work in Shenzhen. And on the other hand, if the foreigner resides in Shenzhen, he cannot come to Hong Kong every day to work because he doesn't have a Hong Kong employment visa. So it's very easy for, mainland, for people from mainland China. This option is feasible for them, but when it comes to foreigners, it's much more complex. Great. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, as I said, there are still questions that have been unanswered, and, and I promise you that Marcus will answer them um, at the end of today's webinar. If you do have any questions uh, in the interim period that have not, you've not written to us today, uh, please don't hesitate to contact Marcus directly. I'm sure he would be thrilled to, to reach out to you and, and answer any queries that you have. Uh, Marcus, thank you very much for today's presentation as well and for your time on, on presenting this, this topic. Again, um, just one last point. You know, if anybody is interested in our complimentary um, information, on our magazines or any other resources that we publish. Uh, you can subscribe to our e-newsletter free of charge or follow us on several social media channels like LinkedIn and YouTube. Last but not least, we have two more webinars in this webinar series. Um, tomorrow we're going to be talking about the exchange of information article that most jurisdictions in the world are now subject to. Um, tomorrow we're focusing on how that impacts Hong Kong companies. And on Friday, we will be talking about um, the tax exemption policy in Hong Kong and how you can apply for it. So if you are interested in either of those topics, don't hesitate to subscribe. Um, the, the doors are still open uh, to do that. So we look forward to seeing you there. Thanks again to everybody. I wish you all a very pleasant evening. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>